Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Jim Cobray. Before we go any further tonight, in tonight's service, give me a little light. I know that there's a bunch of you out there right now that you need to come home to Jesus. You've been in sin. You've been screwing around long enough. You know it's you. You know I haven't been right with God. And I just love you enough, and so does God, not to let you last another moment in that position. And just because you came to church tonight doesn't mean you're gonna get out of that position until you decide to get out and get God. And I'm inviting you right now to get a hold of a neighbor if you need to, a friend, or just come by yourself. I'm inviting you to get out of your seat, get in the aisle, come and meet me in front. We'll pray together to invite Jesus. You see, the issue is, here's the issue. The issue is not that you don't know Jesus. You know Jesus. You celebrate Christmas every year and you know him. You celebrate Easter every year. You know who he is. But that won't get you to heaven. In fact, at times, if you were asked, you would even say you are a Christian. But you know deep down in your heart, man, it's questionable. If you died, you'd probably go to hell. And you don't want to do that and you know it. And you know I'm talking to you, so stop playing games. And this is your time. God is speaking to you right now through me. And he's telling you to get out of your seat and get up here. And listen to what I'm going to say to you. There is not just one or two of you. There is a bunch of you tonight. Don't last another moment and separated from God. Don't take on this position constantly fighting all the time. You just need to surrender to God all of your heart and all of your life. You need to make that commitment. It's called being born again. And man, I'm telling you, the power of God will come on in the inside of you and wash you. They're gonna sing that song, and I don't know if anybody will come, but I'm gonna tell you, there's a, I hate to tell you this, I wanted to just say 15, but God told me 25. And I went, oh man. You know, I can, I, I, got, I got 15 faith tonight. I don't have 25 faith tonight. But you're the one he's talking about. You need to get out of your seat. People let you out. This is not a movie theater. You're not knocking over someone's popcorn. You can get in the aisle, meet me right here in front. And while this song is being sung, you come. There's healing waiting for you. There's a new life waiting for you. There's a future waiting for you. There's eternity waiting for you. There's being free. Can you imagine this? Being set free is waiting for you. The load, the weight that you've been carrying is gonna be removed tonight and you know it. You need to come. As they sing the song, push your way up here. Who cares what anybody thinks? It's only important what God sees. Get out of your seat, get in the aisle. Meet me right here in front, come on. Thank you. 
to come. Thank you. There's two more of you that need to come. I can't make you come. But the Spirit of God's tugging on your heart right now. There's one more of you that need to come. And it's time to come home. God knows what he's doing. You got to trust him. There's only one way, and he is the way. Surrendering your heart to him is what this is all about. Mm, mm, mm. One more, and let me, let me define that, who that person is. There may be more that come up, but you're a man, and you're noted for being a tough ass. And it's just shut up. And just listen to me. The Spirit of God's talking. And it's just time. God says, tough ass, get up here. It's time to get saved. Come on. Come on. Come on. Look at this. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Look at them come. Come on. You just needed somebody to tell you the truth. Come on. Hallelujah. Thank God, thank God you guys have come. And look over here to your left. See this guy waving at you? His name is Pastor Joel. He's a really good guy. No weird stuff goes on. Listen to this closely. Tonight is your night of salvation. Everything changes tonight. Everything changes tonight. Tonight is the beginning of great things. Tonight is healing. Tonight is freedom. Tonight is cleanliness. Tonight there's a new life ahead of you that's going to explode with the excitement of God. So I want you to make a left turn. I want you to follow Pastor Joel right over this way. Come on, give the Lord a great big praise. Let's go to our knees, prayer. You stand to your feet, and then we'll get into the word. Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. We just love you so much, Lord. We're excited about what you're doing. We're excited about what you're saying. We're excited about learning your will, your way. We're excited about seeing how to do life your way instead of our way. That is so neat, Father. We're so grateful that you sent the word, you sent the Holy Spirit to reveal the word, to empower us, to equip us, to cleanse us. We thank you, God, that the teacher of the church is not a man, but the teacher of the church is the Holy Spirit. So welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us and motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. Now, Lord, we never think of ourselves as better than our brothers and sisters that are in other churches. But if they're preaching the gospel, hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ somewhere in the Inland Empire, on the planet, somewhere tonight, we want you to bless them, God. Bless our Baptist brothers and Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatics, Pentecostals. Thank you for Calvary Chapels in Harvest Oak Valley and Oasis, Inland Christian Center, the way, the will. Well, the, we just thank you, God, for Trinity Emmanuel Baptist, our Foursquare brothers and sisters. We, we thank you, God, for what you're doing in the Catholic faith, and we thank you for what you're doing in our Adventist brothers and sisters. We give you the praise, give you the glory, give you the honor. As you would bless us, we also ask that you bless them. In Jesus' mighty name, with a great big shout, we all say, amen. <laughs> Let me just take for a moment as we go to the journey into a prosperous life, part number four, just to take, a, you know, maybe just a few moments and let's review just a little bit, because it's been a few weeks since, since we've been together on this subject. The subject's a great subject. Let me tell you the truth. The truth is that you'd have to be spiritually really off the wall not to see that God wants to prosper you. Now, wait a minute. Then somebody comes along and makes a statement, and every time we've been together, I made this statement, that if God wants to prosper me, why doesn't he prosper me? 
Could it be that the prosperity that God wants to give you would corrupt you and ruin you and keep you from the blessings if you don't know how to handle the prosperity? And that's where your heart is developed so that you can handle the blessings. Because handling the blessings are oftentimes more difficult than handling the problems. You can handle the problems because you're used to that. But handling blessings is something that's totally unique. And I believe that more people fail when they start to get blessed with the things of God than that fail because of tough times or difficult situations. God truly wants to bless you. The first thing, in order for anybody to ever even get to the place of getting on the road, of being prosperous, you've got to come to a conclusion that God wants to do this. And because God wants to do it, it's not based on how smart you are, cute you are. It's not based on how talented or gifted you are. It's not based on how educated you are, what your family background is about. Never been based on any of that. That's why it's always a level playing field with God. If somebody will submit their heart to God, and if somebody will follow God, and if somebody will get in there and just go with God with all of their heart and all of their soul and all of their mind and all of their being, guess what happens? God wants to bless them. But if they don't want to do this, they want to walk compromised with God, a little in, a little out. Let me tell you something. You will get compromised results, if that, which, by the way, is no results at all. And so for all of us that are in here tonight, just coming to a place, because so many of us grew up never believing that we could ever have or be or do anything. If we could just get by, and that's our prosperity is just getting by. What if the level of prosperity that you think of now is not the level of prosperity that God wants to give you? When I search the word of God and find out what God was doing with the children of Israel and with his children, I see them incredibly more prosperous than we can ever imagine. The children of Israel didn't just have a little bit of grapes as they went into the promised land. They had wells that were already dug for them. They had, they had uh, vegetables and, and fruits and and, and, and figs and dates beyond, and the sizes of what they had were in portions were way beyond comprehension in today's understanding. God maybe wants to do more for you than you can imagine. The first thing you start to do is you got to start imagining, and you got to start believing that God wants to do this. And you see it in the scripture, all through scripture, that God literally is, is joyful. He really has a great uh, joy over the prosperity of his saints. Can you imagine such a thing? And God gives you the strength to get wealth, Deuteronomy 8 chapter says. God really wants to bless you, but oftentimes we don't understand how this works. Now, in order to understand this, this is part number four. We've had three previous parts. I'm just going to quickly review them for a moment. Let's listen, listen up. Part number one. We talked about in order for you to be successful, you have to have the right source. Source is not your job. The source is not your relatives. The source is not the income. The source is not the stock market. The source is not the real estate market. Remember how we talked about such things? The source has always got to be in the depth of your heart, God. In other words, it's not the business that you're going to do that's going to make you rich. It's going to be the heart that you have for God. Your source comes from God. Now, wait a minute. Let's stop right there just for a moment. I know I'm reviewing. I'm kind of going someplace, but I want you to follow me. Can you get rich without God? Absolutely. In terms of money, yes. But in terms of life, no. In terms of eternity, absolutely no. But you can get rich, you can get prosperous in financial without God. There's people all over the place that are doing it every day right before your very eyes. But what, remember how the scripture goes on, he says, what good is it if a man gains the what? Whole world and loses his what? Soul. So really, and the outcome of that is you weren't rich at all. See? And even though you had a bunch of material things. So what's your source? Before you get started anywhere, Check your heart as to what the source is. Where are you going to draw life, 
prosperous life from? Your job? Relatives? Or, or is it going to be from God? Now, if it's going to be from God, there's going to be some biblical financial patterns found in Scripture that you're going to have to adhere to. Follow me? There's just going to, it have to be that way. In other words, there's not going to violate his word just to make you prosperous, and he's not going to do something that's going to hurt you just to prosper, even though he wants to prosper you. He'll keep the prosperity back from you because if the prosperity can't be handled by you, guess what? It'll, it'll hurt you. The source has got to be God. I'm going to quickly go through this. Remember we talked about relationship, got to have trust, obedient relationship. We talked about your responsibility. If you did get that uh, first CD, it's a responsibility you have to do something with what you have. A responsibility you have to be what God has called you to be. We also found out that this is uh, all about whether or not the connection is right with God. If you have a connection with something, but you don't have a connection with God the right way. See, a lot of people have connection with God based on their terms instead of a connection with God based on who he is. Did you just follow that? See, a lot of people have a connection with God based on their terms but instead of having a connection with God based on his terms. This is about him. Listen, we're made in the image of God. God's not made in the image of us. We follow him. He doesn't follow us. Is that not true? So we find ourselves oftentimes coming along asking God to come and be what we think God ought to be like according to our terms, and our connection is wrong from the very beginning. And you got AC plugged into DC, and it isn't going to work without some kind of an inverter. And that's where God comes in. Part number two we found out that keeps people away from prosperity is self Importance. When you start to think of yourself, you see how important you are. All of a sudden, you know, you, you, get off of, you get off of God and you start, because prosperity does that to people. It makes people feel self-important. You know, success in anything can be devastating to someone's life. I, I tell you this, there's so many people. A young man came up to me the other day and he, and he made this statement. He asked me this question. He says, why did somebody, and he was talking about somebody, he said, fail when he had everything. And I said, because some people are just afraid of success. Just absolutely afraid of success. Some of you that are in here tonight, if you had success, you'd be so afraid you wouldn't know what to do with it. Afraid of losing it, afraid of keeping it, afraid of maintaining it, afraid of everything. So you run from the success, and you've got to find out the reasons why you do that, which is simple, by checking yourself with God and then getting back in with the things of God. So we find ourselves self, uh, oftentimes self-importance, material importance. In other words, we, we find ourselves kept away from prosperity because we put too much emphasis in our lives on material things instead of on God. If I get the material things, then I'll be happy. Can I tell you something? Happiness never is built in for any lasting time from material things. Happiness comes from a relationship with God. And, and, and Disneyland can be the happiest place on the planet, but God has got joy every day in the, uh, all the time. And it, by the way, it's only happy while you're going there. Have you ever noticed when you finally get out of the parking lot, get home and get in bed, that's when you're happiest? <laughs> if you've been there lately, you know what I'm talking about. Is that place a zoo lately? It's like a madhouse. Man, it's like crazy. And so it's just wild. Lazy life will keep you from prosperity. You don't do anything. Uh, uh, you know, no effort whatsoever towards the poor. And, you know, God's looking for somebody who's going to not be tight one, but be generous. And then we found out in part number three, holding onto a living God, how to do this. And that we found out in part number three, remember about how to make God bigger. The, listen to this. The bigger you make God, the smaller your problems become. And you make God bigger. God is already big. And you have to make him bigger than the, what you're facing in the future. We talked about part number three. Part number four is kind of fun. I like this. This is where we're going tonight. I like this. Evil effects of prosperity. In other words, what are the effects of people who have been prosperous that kept them? And why do I want to know evil effects of prosperity? Because if I start to get prosperous, I want to make sure I don't act like this. 
Because when I act like this, you end up losing. See what I'm saying? So why get prosperous if you're just going to end up losing? But can I tell you something that I found out? If you know what to look for, you won't fall in the trap. When you fall in a hole, it's because you didn't know the hole was there. If you know the hole's there, you don't fall in the holes. Everybody listening to what I'm saying? So what we're doing is looking at areas in people's lives that have failed, evil effects, took their prosperity and took it and ran down. They fell in a hole because they didn't know they were getting trapped. So let me just share it with you. It's very important for us to see some things. The first thing I want you to see is something called self-confidence. Now, self-confidence is different than self-importance. I want you to hear this again. Self-confidence is different than self-importance. Anytime the word self is in there, you just void out the power of God blessing you. Listen to what I'm going to say to you. you got to get this. It, the Word of God is so oftentimes mistaught, and, and, and it's not always, but sometimes. Like for an example, in the book Galatians, 5th chapter, verse 22 to verse 23, it says the fruit of the Spirit. Fruit of the Spirit is the Spirit of God, Holy Spirit, produces something in someone's life. And he makes this statement. He says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, temperance. Meekness of which, you know, and then he goes on. But the word temperance is an interesting word. Almost every translation you'll ever have for the word temperance is the word self-control. Did you know that that is absolutely not the translation at all biblically? God is not looking for self-control in you or me. And the Holy Spirit doesn't produce self-control. The Holy Spirit produces godly control. So what God's really looking for is godly importance, not self-importance. What God's really looking for is godly confidence, not self-confidence. Someone says, wait a minute, Pastor. You mean to tell me that if I have self-confidence, that's bad? You better believe it's bad. Because now you're taking God out of it. Now, it's good in the world. It's good to be your friends and neighbors, relatives, and family. It's good in your vision as how people perspective they see you but it's really bad in your relationship with God because it's not about you having self-confidence in yourself because that's not what God's trying to do he's trying to get you not to think better of yourself he's trying to get you to think better of him is anybody else? <laughs> see and and we miss this all the time because and it's so easy when you start to get prosperous you start to get self confident Man, I got my shoulders back. I feel good about myself. I can do this. I can get the job done. I, I feel pretty good. I, I, and all of a sudden, you know, I'm a self-confident person, and I'm voiding out the very power of God, which is the Holy Spirit's power, to bring me to a place of blessing, prosperity. You know, you can be talented in an area and get self-confident in that talent, but who gave you the talent? You know, you can, you can get self-confident in your education, but who, who gives you the mind to get the education? You know? You can get confidence in your job, right, because you do it better than anybody else, but who gives you the ability to get up every day, take a deep breath, and have the energy to do the job? See? And what we do is we've got this wrong picture. God is never trying to get you to be self-confident. It's not about some psycho-cybernetics, new age guru, a mental mm, utopia reaching nirvana. This is about bringing you back to the personal relationship with Jesus Christ and you becoming humble, dependent on him. You got to be dependent on him. Is everybody listening? So self-confidence is very important. Let me just take you, if I may, to Daniel in the fourth chapter. And I'll just put it up on the overhead. The king spoke saying, verse number 30, Is not this the great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? So here's, here's this mighty, powerful Nebuchadnezzar. The, I mean, the, the most powerful king there could possibly be upon the planet. And he says, and the king speaks and he says, this is not great Babylon that I have built with a royal dwelling. That, look at the eyes and the mys. The my and I and my majesty and my. And all of a sudden you get self-confident. God's out of the picture when you get in. 
Get yourself out, get God in. That's what this is all about. It was the whole problem with Adam and Eve from the very beginning is they got God out and got themselves in to make the choice to partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and of evil. And from that point on, man's been doing exactly the same thing. So it's not about getting self-confident. I know I'll get my degree and then I'll be confident about my job and I can get a better job. You can get a better job without a degree. It's all you have to do is find out who God is and get confident in him. He's the one that backs me. He's the one that opens doors no man can open, closing doors no man can close. Somebody ought to know that self-confidence is not what this is about. This is about godly confidence in him. If you go to the fifth chapter, let me tell you a little story about the fifth chapter of Daniel. There's this guy named Belteshazzar. He's taken over the, the kingdom. And he is like the great grandson or grandson of, of the great King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, Nebuchadnezzar was one of the most powerful rulers on the planet at that time. When he spoke, people died if he wanted them dead, or he exalted people. Whatever he wanted, he got done. And 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 there's an army coming against the city of Babylon. The Medo-Persian army is coming against the city of Babylon. And this king, his name is Belteshazzar, is saying this is an impregnable city. Nobody has ever violated its walls. Nobody could get in this place. There's no way they can get in. Let's have a party and show them how stupid they are. They can't get to us. And then all of a sudden, if you'll remember, there was writing on the wall. They're in a drunken state having an orgy. And they're having this wild party when all of a sudden a hand comes down from heaven, what are they smoking? <laughs> and writes on the wall. You know what I'm talking about. And all of a sudden it's like freak out time. Well, they go find old man Daniel to interpret the writing of the scripture. And Daniel starts to explain to him. Now remember, we're talking about self-confidence. It will absolutely destroy the blessings of God and keep you from the prosperity that God wants you to have. Let's read about it in the fifth chapter of Daniel, verse number 20. Could you just pop that up for, for just a second and let's take a look at it together. It says, but when the heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened in pride, he was disposed from the kingly throne and they took away his glory from him. So here's Daniel explaining to Belteshazzar the story of his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was great, he was powerful, but when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened in pride. In other words, he started thinking of himself. Verse number 21, Belteshazzar's hearing more about his grandfather. And, and, and verse number 21a, it says this, And when he was driven from the sons of men, his heart was made like the beast and dwell within the wild donkeys. And he was fed him with grass and like oxen to body. And what took place is this great, powerful king, man, nothing like him on the planet, is now made by God to be like an animal. And instead of being in his kingdom, he is now like a jackass eating the grass and he is not bathing. He's like an animal. I mean, he was like uh, horrible. By the way, the guy eventually wakes up from all of this and gets right with God, which is really cool. I think you'll find Nebuchadnezzar in heaven, which is an interesting thing. Verse the B, let's go to B. It says this. Well, his, his, well, his, his body was wet with dew from heaven until he knew the moist of high God rules in the kingdom of men and appoints over it whom he chooses. Verse number 22, watch this. Verse 22, but you, the son of Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, although you knew all of this. Sometimes, listen to this, we are so hard-headed, we know what to do, but we still don't do it. And then we wonder why we don't get blessed. We know we need to have a better relationship with God. We know we need to stop messing around with God. We know we need to get into a place like a church that's going to teach me how to grow in the things of God. But we just don't do it. And we wonder why we don't get blessed. Here he comes along. He makes this brilliant statement. You knew 
about your father, and yet you didn't humble yourself. You saw how God Almighty, the creator of the heavens and earth, made him like an animal for years, eating of the grass in the field, literally with a dew upon him like it. wings and scales grew on his body from the filth that was on his body. He ate the grass. He ate the weeds. He ate like an animal, and then he comes to his senses and got saved, and you knew this, but you still wouldn't humble yourself. Wow. Verse 23. Do we have 23 up there? And you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven. Can I just make a statement to you? You know this verse that says you have lifted yourself up? Here's our thinking on that. Watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. You, God, I'm telling you, I'm greater than you, God. I'm going to tell you how it is. I'm a... That's not what he's doing. Lifting yourself up against the Lord of heaven is this. When you think your ways are more important than his, you have just lifted yourself up. We do that all the time ourselves. And that's a scary thing because he's on the verge of having everything in his life that was prosperous removed. In that one night, everything fell. So you've brought the vessels here, and oh, it's a long story about the vessels, the Lord and your wives and your concubine drank from them. And verse number, go to the B, B section. And you have uh, praised the God of silver, gold, bronze, wood, and stone. In other words, you're really into your material things, which do not see and hear or know. Uh, have you got another verse that uh, goes on? And God who holds your breath in your hand and your own in all your ways, you have not glorified. We oftentimes know what we should do, and we still don't do it. But we expect God to do his part when we don't do our part. Yep. Now look, you didn't come here tonight to play church. We came here to grow. We came here to evaluate ourselves. We came here because we really, deep down inside, want God to be number one and want to be prosperous, and want God to bless us, want to bless our families, want to be in heaven, want to make it. And that's why we're learning this word. Self-confidence will keep you from God. Number two, trusting in the moment. The evil effects. that will evilly affect trusting in a moment. Do you know how many times we trust in a moment? Let me explain what I mean by trusting in a moment. A guy's got 50 bucks in his pocket. He's feeling good about himself. Doesn't need anybody, doesn't need anything. When he doesn't have 50 bucks, man, he is humble, down. He is going to church. He is he's praying more, reading his Bible more. Give him 50 bucks. Give him 100 bucks. Give him a job. Give him some toys. Give him a motorcycle. Give him a great truck. Give him a boat for the river. And all of a sudden, man, we got our trust in the moment instead of in the things of God. And we put our trust in what we have oftentimes for that day instead of forever. Whenever is what this is all about. And when you put your time, and you become, and I do too at times, I become the person that becomes satisfied with what I have today. I really don't have to make an effort for tomorrow because I got tomorrow covered. And all of a sudden, man, guess what happens? I find myself voiding out the very power of the Holy Spirit that wants to take me to a level of prosperity. Is somebody listening? Trusting in the moment. So cool. Look at this. And Luke, just pop it up. Uh, I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to put up the verses for you guys. Luke 6, chapter verse 25. Woe to you who are full. Man, that, can I see, see the words full? <laughs> Prosperity. Got it all your needs met. Feel pretty good about yourself. Woe to you who are full. Watch this. For you shall hunger. Woe to you who laugh now. Today's cool. I got my confidence in this moment. For you shall mourn and weep. Let me tell you something. There's only one place that you need to always set your heart upon, and that's trusting in the things of God. Day in and day out. Never in the stuff and material things that you have for that day, that job, or anything else. Jobs come and go. But the supplier of your finances, whose God never comes and goes. Are you listening to me? 
You know, and when you go to work, you go to work for him, the Bible says. He's your boss. Therefore, if they fire you, your boss got to keep paying you. Because you're working for him. Man, it just works. Don't ask me, it just does. Number three, we're talking about evil effects of prosperity. So oftentimes, we can do self-confidence will mess you up. Instead of godly comes, trusting in the moment. I like this, misplaced faith. Misplaced faith means your faith was there and all of a sudden you got wealthy and you took your eyes off the ball. Or let me put it to you like this. You got some prosperity and you took your eyes off of what is important. And you started following something that's important. When I was a young man, I played professional baseball, which most of you don't know the team that I played for. I played for a team called the Kansas City Athletics. They're now called the Oakland Athletics. And so when I played professional, there was always you kept your eye on the ball. Never expect to hit the ball if you're never gonna have your eye on the ball. You gotta have your eye on the ball. Have your eye on the ball. Have your eye on the ball. It was always that. And we do the same thing with God. If we take our eyes off God, we have misplaced faith. All of a sudden, what you're looking at the most becomes what you believe in the most. And so what we do oftentimes is we find ourselves starting out in great faith with God. God starts to bless us and then prosperity comes into us and then we take our relationship with God lightly and we have misplaced faith where we used to be strong in faith. We've taken our eyes off the ball and put our eyes on something else and all of a sudden we're doing something we shouldn't be doing and we end up failing. There's this amazing person by the name of Solomon. Solomon wrote... So much of the scripture, it's amazing. Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and, I mean, just Song of Solomon. I mean, there's just many things. Just a, a, a brilliant relationship with God. I believe he's in hell today. And I'll read you the verses that I believe why he's in hell. He was the son of David, king of Israel. One of David's sons. He's the one who built the temple God had so given him wisdom, it was amazing. People would come from all over the world to hear the wisdom of Solomon and what his answers were in life and the directions that he had because it was all about God. Then Solomon got caught up in his wealth and his power and who he was and he started to mingle with people who were contrary to his ways and he married and had concubines that were from other gods. And he ended up failing. I'll read to you, if I may, in the scripture. Go back with me to 1 Kings, the 11th chapter. Let's put it up on verse number 4. Write it down. For it was so that when Solomon was old, I think that's the saddest part, is that you live your whole life, finally get to the end of your life, all you have to do is live out a few more years successfully. How many people, when they're old, fail? Instead of running the race to the end. When he was old, that his wives turned his heart after other gods. Oh, wait a minute. Misplaced faith? The wives turned his heart after other gods. Solomon, the son of David, in the bloodline of Jesus is David? That means in the bloodline of Jesus is Solomon? And in his bloodline, he turns to other gods. And his heart was not loyal. I should have highlighted the word loyal because that's what this is all about. To the Lord his God, as was the heart of his father, David. Can I tell you something? If your heart turns to other gods, you have misplaced faith. And I doubt you're going to make it to heaven. I'm not the judge. I don't know. Maybe we'll get there and praise God he'll be there. I'm not the one who decides that. God is. But quite frankly, that doesn't go against what I know to be scripture. And I wouldn't be surprised if he didn't make it. This is a very serious thing, my friends. Misplaced faith. And a lot of things can get your faith off the ball. Put it somewhere it doesn't need to be. And one of the errors is prosperity. Some people say, yes, that's why I don't want to be prosperous. No, that's stupid. 
I want to just stay humble. Stay humble, be dependent on God, get prosperous and bless others. It's a great witness that God wants to use to a lost and dying world. That you don't have to be lost and you don't have to be dying, but there's a God that loves you and cares about you. Is anybody listening? Fourth and last one for tonight. I love this. False views of the future. We're talking about evil effects of prosperity. And when you're prosperous, oftentimes we'll get a false view of our future or the future. Luke, in the, if you will, in the 12th chapter, in verse 16, says it like this. He and he had spoke, speaking of Jesus, a parable to them, saying, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. So we see that right off the bat, he's very wealthy. Jesus is not going to come along and say, he's a creep because he's rich. Jesus says the ground of a rich man yielded plentifully. Then it goes on in verse number 17. Jesus doesn't have a problem with that. And he thought within himself saying, what shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? In other words, I have such wealth, I don't have room to be able to store them. Is that bad? Wait a minute. Is that bad? No. That's not bad. That's good. Next verse, watch this. And he said... I will do this. I will put down my barns and build greater. And there I will store up my crops from, and my goods. Is that bad? You think making business decisions to prosper and to be successful and how to store up the things that God gives you is bad? No. Nothing is bad about what this man is saying until the next verse. Next verse comes along, and I will say in my soul, soul, I have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. In other words, my future is on my stuff instead of in my God. <laughs> and he had a false sense of security based on the foolishness false view of the future. Verse number 20 comes along. But God said to him, fool! Don't you love God? So many times we never, we ne we never think God ever talks that way. You know, if you read your Bible, God, God's pretty blunt. You know, some of you are offended because I'm blunt. You know, you ought to read your Bible and find out what blunt's all about. Hmm? Yeah, your righteousness is as dirty as filthy rags. You know what those rags are? Those don't go there. Mm-mm-mm-mm. Those -mm -mm -mm. don't go there. One point he says, oh, I don't even want to go there. I don't want to go there. <laughs> Believe me, he says things I, I wouldn't even say in the pulpit area, but God says them. Fool! You think God would talk that way? Man, you better believe God talks that way. Says it's just like he was, man. When the people were acting like whores, what did he call them, you whores? <laughs> he was in walking the streets of San Bernardino, said, yo ho. <laughs> Come on, you know it. Just a ho. <laughs> it's true. You know it's true. So God says, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then those will things be with which you have provided. Verse number 21. So is, is, is he who lays up his treasure for himself and not the riches towards God. So this guy here, he had it all. And, but is all stuck in a false view of the future. Let me tell you something. Your view of the future has got to have God all around it or it just doesn't work. Yeah. 
It doesn't matter how old you are, and I'm not just preaching this because I'm old. I do what I do because I have God on the inside of me. I can't sit back and do nothing. I have to produce. Because I have God on the inside of me, I have to produce. As long as there's a breath in me and a man unsaved on this planet, I will produce. Not because I'm talented and self-confident. Not because I have some kind of faith in myself or I'm in a place, if you will, that is trusting in a moment. I have confidence that I'm standing in front of you right now. I have God on the inside of me. And when you have God on the inside of you, how in the world can you stop? How in the world do you finally say, I give up? How do you world do you say you quit, you, you didn't make it? How do you ever, wait a minute, is God not the God who gives Abraham a baby when he's how old? Who wants that blessing? Not me. I was telling Deborah the other day, how would you like to be 90 years old having a baby? I mean, when the grandkids come over now, we can hardly wait for them to leave. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> Maybe it's just me, not mama. <laughs> guys, there's a great future ahead of you. Don't stop. Learn how to trust God with all of your heart. Learn, and this is a learning thing, learn how to be what God wants you to be. How you can hear from the voice of the Lord and follow him. And then at the end of your life, you will be so prosperous. You can't turn to the left or turn to the right, do your own thing. This is a one thing, one time going for God. You've got one life to live. Believe God for great things. He wants to do great things in you and he wants to do great things through you. He just doesn't want the great things to destroy you. Are you following me? So, so the more you and I develop our hearts for greater capacity, the more God will pour in his blessings. Be patient. This is a work in progress. This is a work in progress. I just started three businesses. I'm going to be 69 in, in August. And this is a work in progress. And so my friends... It's wonderful when you know God is coming along and being your partner. How can you fail? Because even if you fall, he'll pick you up. Even if you lose everything, he'll give it back. How do you fail? You fail by operating in the foolish things that we talked about tonight. If God spoke to you, come on, give the Lord a great big praise. You hear that? Isn't God good? Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. 
Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.